Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time that you give to us to come and worship you on Sundays. Help us today to, to worship you in, in mind, body, soul. We ask that what is said here today would be helpful to everyone um, and that we would all, um, as a result, come to view your word um, in a way that's even more, more true than it was before to us. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So today I would like to talk about moral issues with God in the Bible. A lot of people have moral issues with the Bible and some of them require some, some of the issues with the Bible do require some explanation. Hebrews 11.6 says, but without faith is it, it is impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. So we see there that God expects, expects us to have faith in him. But if there are issues in the Bible that gnaw at us, it makes it difficult for us sometimes to have complete faith in God. So, some say that a reading of the Old Testament demonstrates the fact that God is not loving. And they point to mass, mass genocide ordered in the Old Testament. Uh, they, or, they, they point to views on women in the Bible. And they point to slavery. The Bible condones slavery, tacitly condones slavery. So there's a, there are many other issues, I would say, but those are the three primary ones, and I want to I wrestle with those three today. Um, and now, first, let me be clear. Most of the time when people said they have concerns about what the Bible says, moral concerns, sometimes it's just a veiled resistance against the Bible. Sometimes people resist the Bible blatantly. They just say, I don't want anything to do with the Bible and God, you know, I don't want anything to do with him. But in most cases, they appeal essentially to a self-righteous rationale that makes them feel okay about resisting God. They say, God is cruel. I want to be moral. Therefore, I don't believe, you know, I can't have anything to do with that. So, but their arguments fall flat because they're based on rank ignorance. First, many people come to the Bible with the idea that when the Bible doesn't immediately condemn something, as soon as it talks about it, that it's saying it's okay. And that's not true, especially in the narrative portions of the Bible. For instance, we, receive, we read the story of Samuel. I'm sorry, not Samuel, Samson. I don't know about you, but sometimes I read through the, the story of Samson and I just say, wow, it's amazing that God used that guy. Um, he did some pretty nasty stuff. And the Bible doesn't say anything about that. But consider that it's just a narrative. They're not, it's not gonna just, God's not gonna step in to a narrative and say, by the way, I don't condone that, and let's move on. Um, but secondly, many social and cultural constructs that we have today don't really apply back then. So let's talk about, let's start off with slavery. A lot of people think that the Bible condones slavery, but is that true? This is where we talk about the cultural concerns. Is first century slavery the same thing as 18th century slavery? When we think of slavery, we think of plantations, we think of black slaves, white slave owners, we think of beatings, lynchings, rape, um, and to some extent that was all true in the 18th century. But first we have to be clear that that was probably the exception. 
not all 18th century slave owners were cruel. Um, it's just kind of like the workplace nowadays. You have some bosses that are absolute jerks. You know, I had one once. It's like he'd do anything he could to just put his boot on your neck. Um, but there are other bosses who, in my mind, are a little more intelligent. They, these guys realize happy employees, happy customers, right? And so, and, and if you really think about it, and if you look into it, the vast majority of bosses are like that second group. I've had several bosses in my life, probably, you know, eight or nine, and I would say only one of them was a jerk, <laughs> you know? The rest of them, I would put in that category with they wanted to make their employees happy. That's the same way, you know, slavery is. We hear about the horror stories. Now, I'm not condemn, condoning slavery. Don't get me wrong. I'm just saying that it doesn't deserve the rap that it got because most slave owners were not cruel. And also, when you, you have to remember that when you're, you're listening to somebody talk about something like slavery, do they have an agenda? If they do, you have to be careful because people with agendas have to be checked out. Now, two aspects of 18th century, when I say 18th century, everybody knows what I'm talking about the, in the United States. Two aspects of 18th century slavery were unquestionably immoral. First, the, the way that the slaves were acquired. How were they acquired? They were, they were essentially kidnapped. Tra uh, tr slave traders from the United States or from Britain or where, whatever would invade African villages and kidnap people at gunpoint or knife point. And so, as a result, these slaves had absolutely no resources. They had no money, no family, nothing. And this is called chattel slavery, which means the slave was completely owned by the slave owner, and they had complete control of their lives, bar nothing. Now, that kind of slavery should not be read into the Bible, because that type of slavery was nowhere at least in the areas that we read about in the Bible. Slaves in the time of Paul were not destitute. Where often they were paid wages and they often could accumulate pretty large nest eggs and they could become actually wealthy. There's one scholar named Dr. Demetrius Kirtatis, I don't know how to say his name, he wrote that some slaves managed, managed to amass large fortunes and considerable property. Think about it. Income, a lot of income sometimes, no expenses. Some slaves were highly educated. In fact, slaves could read and write and often served as household scribes for employers who were themselves illiterate. And the second thing is how and why people became slaves in the Roman world was very different from 18th century. The most important thing is that it had nothing to do with ethnicity. People often became, became slaves voluntarily to achieve financial security and usually for a limited time. That was probably the vast majority. Or it might have been imposed judicially to force someone to work off their debt. And that was called indentured servitude. Now, it's because of these differences between 18th century slavery and 1st century slavery. Some people say that's the reason that they don't say slave in the Bible all the time. They say bondservant. They said that's a more accurate depiction. And the reason that they don't want to use that word slave is because it brings up these images of 18th century, which did not apply back then. Now, it doesn't mean that Paul is condoning slavery in the Bible, 
it could be cruel, it could be oppressive, and Paul did encourage people to gain their freedom if they could. But at the same time, he didn't approach the subject like an abolitionist from the American days. He just tried to give readers godly advice about how they should act from God's perspective if they found themselves in the, in the position of being a slave or being a slave owner, for that matter. It's kind of like, I see it as, as like our obligation to respect the government. God says, obey the government. Does that mean that he's condoning everything that they're doing? I would think not. Um, now, secondly, the New Testament expresses equality between Christian slaves and their owners. Now, that was a very radical departure from the cultural norm back then, this idea of equality. And But if a Christian would look at his slave, who was also a Christian, as a brother or a sister. So Paul said, keep that in mind. The ancient Roman world was characterized by a stratification of the rich and the poor they were in completely different social classes. And Paul's, but the Christian ethic was completely different from that. Paul's vision about slavery in the body of Christ would have been shocking to the average person back then. Galatians 3.28 says, There is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free, there is no male and no female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. Now in light of what that verse says, how do you think that any right-thinking Christian viewed the 18th century slavery trade? The fact is that Christians were the most opposed to 18th century slavery and they were the driving force behind abolition. That doesn't mean that all Christians were anti-slavery, they weren't, but we shouldn't conflate the actions of individual Christians with Christianity. It's important principle in and of itself. Christians are characterized, unfortunately, by their failure to act like Christians. But Christian doctrine, when you understand it rightly, became the foundation for the abolition of the Af African slave trade. For example, the Bible explicitly condemned kidnapping people and forcing them into lifelong servitude. And do you want to guess what the penalty was for violating that? <laughs> so Puritans like Richard Baxter, Sam, Samuel Sewell, were vehement in their writings and speaking against slavery, and also John Newton, John Wesley. Here's the point. The Bible must be read carefully within its original context rather than to be read through the lens of modern day. When you read the Bible, remember that what you're reading was written between two and 4,000 years ago. Cultural norms were a lot different. And thus, this does not excuse atrocities, but it does lend a little uh, clarity now, there are times when God makes radical com commands that are considered radically opposed to the culture. Think about his expectations of worship. He absolutely forbidden Israel to worship him in the same ways that the norms, the cultures around worship their gods. <clears throat> but in most cases, he doesn't work that way. What he does is he allows the status quo to proceed, and then he allows his word to have a bearing on people's lives, and then they say, hey, this is wrong. And then they start to go against it. So it's not like God says, that, you know, thou shalt not have a slave. He just in, puts the principles in the Bible, and he lets his Christian, his people, make those connections and start to, to act on them. But in any case, as we said, the kind of slavery in the Bible is completely different from 18th century slavery. I'll just lay it on the line, and you can call me a 
pro-slave, whatever you want. But for me, I see first century slavery as wrong in some cases and not so much in others. I mean, think about it. What's immoral, what is immoral about taking someone into your home who's completely destitute, completely providing for them, giving them literally everything they need in exchange for their service? That's what you had, essentially, in the Bible. And in my mind, this is probably why you don't see a black letter prohibition against slavery in the Bible, because it was different. I mean, what's worse? Let these people, you know, stay on the street and starve to death because I'm not going to take anybody into my house. I might be called a slave owner. Okay, so I hope that um, you got my point there on, on slavery. Here's the second issue. Does the Bible condone the oppression of women? So we live in a world that emphasizes women's rights, and some, some women say that we should just do away with men completely. <laughs> if you think that's an overstatement, Google it. <laughs> it's not. There's people out there. But the Bible, at least at first glance, and can seem patriarchal. Patri is that the right say? Patriarchal? After all, doesn't Paul say, wives, submit to your husbands in Ephesians 5.22? But just like in the, in the case of slavery, it's important that we don't carry our cultural values in. If you want to see what the Bible is really teaching, you have to get below the surface. And when you do that, you'll see that the Bible's principles regarding the relationships between men and women, husbands and wives, was another radical departure from the norm. When you look at the biblical narrative, we see men and women with equal dignity and worth, a vision that would have been countercultural completely, in the Roman world especially. Now, uh, in the in general, in the Roman world, life was not easy for women. It wasn't, it wasn't a, an easy place for them to live. One way this came out was in infanticide. A lot of the girls were not prized as highly as, as men were. So if the woman had a girl and they didn't want it, they'd just leave it there and let it die. So as a result, females in the Roman world composed about one third of the population. Another way, if you go back in that culture, another way you can see how they were treated was in their marriages. It was common for men to enjoy complete sexual freedom. They could, they had concubines and mistresses and they could even have prostitutes but women were expected to remain faithful to their husbands. Even in the New Testament times, Jewish men were allowed to divorce their wives simply because they wanted to, whereas a woman had to show cause to divorce. Women were not even allowed to be witnesses at trials because they were seen as too emotional and untrustworthy because of that. So you think, so you see that things were not equal between men and women in the Roman culture. And we're not talking about the Christian culture, the Jewish culture, just in general. But the biblical view is very eye-opening. Genesis 1.27 says, So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him male and female. He created them right out of the gate. God gives a fundamental affirmation of this view that both men and women are equal in dignity. Both genders, and there's only two, by the way, are equal in dignity, equal in value to God. Both made in God's image. And this biblical view regarding women also comes through in the New Testament. And especially when you just look at the life of Jesus himself, 
John 4, 7, he was talking with women one-on-one, -on -one, which was verboten in a lot of those areas. In John 11, 5, he befriended women, another countercultural thing. In Luke 8, 1 to 3, he traveled with women. Yeah, it doesn't sound like a big thing, but it was back then. He even taught women. Luke 10, 39, do you realize how important that one fact is? Women were not allowed to be educated. They had to be completely dependent on men. If you would have walked into a university back then, you would have not seen one woman there because they were not allowed to be educated. But in the New Testament, we see Jesus not only befriending, educating, talking to women all the time, but he even had women that were financially supporting him. Fast forward, we go to the ministry of Paul, and we see the, the value of women confirmed by him many times. When at the end of a lot of his letters, Paul makes a list of a lot of people that he wants to draw attention to. Thank you for this. Thank you for that. And a large number of them are women. Romans, example, has this long list, and nearly half of them are women. Phoebe, first person mentioned, was a well-known helper. Prisca, who was Priscilla, hosted a church in her house with her husband, Aquila, and a lot of other women who were called workers of, to the Lord. He didn't make any distinction whatsoever. But that's not all. In 1 Corinthians 6, Paul pushes back against the sexual freedom in this Greco-Roman uh, time between men and women. I mean, th there, he said there's no difference. A man can't go off and do what they want while a woman can't. It's, it, they both have to remain true to each other. That was Paul's preaching. And it's hard for us to really appreciate how revolutionary that was. He was suggesting that men and women should be held to the same standard of fidelity, pre precisely because they are equal in dignity. Now, that was unthinkable back then. And it goes a long way to explain why women were so attracted to Christianity in the New Testament. Despite this allegation nowadays that Christianity is hostile to women, Roman women apparently didn't think so. They flocked to it in droves. Uh, Bible, most Bible scholars estimate that nearly two-thirds of early Christian communities were made up of women. Think of that. One-third of the population is women, and yet two-thirds of Christianity is women. Apparently, women found the church to be a place where they could find honor, dignity, fair treatment, and good husbands. Christianity was so popular with women that it was actually ridiculed by Romans <laughs> as a religion for women. One Christian historian from the second century named M Minutius Felix recorded that both Romans and Jews criticized Christians for recruiting their converts from the, quote, the dregs of the populace and credulous woman with the instability natural to their gender. So there's the Roman view of women. So in the Roman world, Christianity was mocked, not for being anti-women, but for being too, too pro-women. Now, isn't that completely opposite of what our culture says? Okay, so slavery, women, hopefully that was helpful. Now let's just do one more subject, and that is genocide. God told Joshua, go into Canaan and devote it to instruct destruction, just take out everyone. And that shocks our sensibility sometimes, if you're honest. So, is God cruel? Now, the answer really comes down to whether we believe that God's view of sin is right, and whether he has a unilateral right, as God, to hold any sin as a capital offense. 
So we Christians, here's the problem. We as Christians tend, we know in our heads that we are sinners. But we don't necessarily think it deserves death and hell. So I think that a lot of us have got that under control. If you're still wrestling with that, I don't think my sin deserves hell. If you're still wrestling with that, talk to an elder, talk to me, talk to Earl. Um, but what does the Bible say about the average person? Let's look at Psalms 14, 2, through three, two and 3. The Lord looks down from heaven upon the children of men to see if there are any who understand, who seek God. They have all turned aside. They have be together become corrupt. There is none who does good. No, not one. That's God's view. The fact is that each of us have offended a holy God. So the question really is, instead of why did God devote the Canaanites to destruction, should be, why did he spare Israel? And if you think about it from an eternal perspective, why is it wrong for an almighty God, one who has the right to do anything he wants with his creatures, to end their lives, to end the lives of those who oppose him? What's wrong with it? What is morally wrong with that? Well, I, I hope that this very brief look at those three areas was at, li at least a little helpful. And it's important for us to have this information for two reasons. First of all, we need to be able to answer objections to other people who are genuinely interested in Christianity but have reservations. But secondly, it's important for us to have this information so that we can also bolster our own faith. When we have questions that pop up in our heads, we can think about this, putting things in context and understanding why God did what he did and why he explained it the way he did. So, is there any questions? Well, I think there's a lot of uh good uh, that you brought to light um, regarding slavery it made me think immediately just a few years ago I read Uncle Tom's Cabin which when Abraham Lincoln met Harriet Beecher Stowe he said you're the little woman who started this big war because she was able to illustrate what slave life was really like most people were ignorant they read that, they became aware how horrible it was for some. And and after reading that book, I thought, if I, I want to be anybody in this book, I want to be Uncle Tom. Because he had a Bible, it didn't matter what was going on, he loved the Lord, he read his Bible, he was a, a spiritual father to many of the other slaves, uh, had the, the best of slave owners, the worst of slave owners in his lifetime and ended up dying at the hands of the worst one. But it really did illustrate something that people were unaware of. Without books, they didn't have, you know, video uh, sure. uh, videos to watch on YouTube. You know, they had to be informed somehow. Sure. And many people just thought it was a good thing. Well, I think that it's important for us as we read, okay, if you think about slavery, I think it's important for us as we read through our Bibles, every time we, we encounter a slave, just take a look at what you're seeing. You're a lot of times seeing a very wealthy individual. You're seeing a person that loves their owner or their master, and their master loves them. I mean, uh, look at the, the slaves that were the servants that were sick and that the masters are looking for Jesus, asking them, please heal them. You know, um, you have, it's a completely different world. Yeah. The, uh, the other thing too is that we are, enslave ourselves to the mortgage companies when we buy a house. Right. We enslave ourselves to the guy we bought our, the car through. 
we'd borrow money and then we'd go and work, work, work. And there was yep. a bumper sticker that was popular years ago that said, I owe, I owe, so off to work I go. Right. And uh, we've, we've just traded in one kind of slavery for another. Uh, so it's, it's easy to point fingers at the slavery of the past, but God provided a way for people who were destitute to get out of their slavery. Today, we have, well, you can hire some lawyer to to file bankruptcy for you, and then all the people that you owe, they're just out. Mm -hmm. They don't get paid back. You don't, you're not, you're not indentured to them to pay the debt that you borrowed money in good faith. They lent you money, and, and uh, people can just, through legal systems, circumvent what they should be yeah. paying. And uh, that's not right. You know, that's just, that's evil. Sure. And, uh, you know, a debt is a debt. It should be paid. So there's, you know, just traded it in for the new model of slavery. All right. Well, I realize this was a bit short today. Um, reason being that um, Errol's going to be gone on Thursday. And so I'm going to be talking on Thursday night. And what I was going to do today, I'm going to do on Thursday. Um, and it is essentially a defense of the Bible from an, an apologetic perspective. Um, and just to give you a, a little bit of a glimpse into what we'll talk about, um, we're going to talk about first textual analysis. How do we compare the Bible? How does the Bible stack up against other ancient literature? Um, and then we're going to discuss um, how, you know, things about like Paul's conversion and how it actually proves that the Bible was written very close to the life of Jesus Christ. Um, so there, there's, gonna, there's a lot to it, and there's a lot of evidence for the resurrection itself. Now, and I'll, as I'll bring up, when people say, well, prove to me that the resurrection occurred with physical evidence. Well, you can't do that. Just like you can't prove that George Washington was the first president of the United States with physical evidence. You have to point to testimonial evidence. And if you're going to accept that George Washington was the first president of the United States, you have to accept that Jesus Christ rose from the dead because it's based on the same type of evidence. So. That's just a little glimpse into what we're going to talk about, and it's going to actually be pretty fun, so I hope you can go. Um, but that's it. Thanks for coming. Let me, let me pray. Lord, we thank you again for this time, and I ask that even though it was short, that it will be beneficial to everyone that came. And we ask that as we go into the worship service today, that we will worship you in the right frame of mind, that you would be pleased with our worship today, that we worship you in spirit and in truth. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Mm -hmm.